because what we find from the research and we get into a whole load of other stuff but one of the critical things is that you never use one or brand never uses one need so what motivates our behaviors is never a single need what makes stories interesting is because we're trying to move from one state to another every brand says this is where you are and this is where you could be so immediately there's a tension between needs so it's it's never just, in fact, even finding the one feeling tone to go with what you say. It's finding the blend. And that's what's really interesting about this. So first of all, you look at a brand, you look at a whole sector, you say, OK, I'm now looking at financial services or fintech. What are the most common blends? Why do they use them? Oh, actually, could I learn from this? Should I use them because they're part of this sector? And then what do I add into that mix to make it mine? So it's a bit like going a pizza. You know, you need a flowery base. You need tomatoes, right? But then what else do you mix? So to be credible pizza, you can't not have tomato and you can't have not have flour. But you blend other stuff. And it's the way you blend it. And this is then gets really interesting to that next stage. So I think those are the first two stages. One is... Just training, just get yourself to be aware of all these different blends, like going into the forest and listening to the birds. Just become aware of what you're listening to, aware of this language, which we often inherently use. But actually, this is really pulling it apart. And then the second one, then is like, well, let's start analysing sectors, competitors. What are they doing? Why are they doing it? Is it really good? I was studying GoDaddy's website. You know, like I can't imagine they're. They're, they're, they're fools as to why they do the way the things are. I'm sure they're analyzing it down to the a millionth degree. So like, what tones are they blending? Why are they blending it? Why then do I find similar tones there as I would do on any accountancy website that wants you to buy their software? Why are they using the same ones? And it becomes really fascinating to understand the DNA, the language that brands use to trigger our behaviors. So those are the thing, the two primary areas. I mean, designers can use them for creative mood boards or blending, say, well, okay, show me some examples of when you mix a sage with the hero, or is there such an example? And then look at it in that way. I know from research points of view, it's been really useful analyzing markets and sectors and a whole lot of stuff. But I think those are the primary ones. First, just get to know them. You know, we've often heard of those 12 archetypal tones even though, don't get me going there, but there's a whole lot of questions about the language and the definitions. Uh, Carl Jung had this lovely phrase, which was, if you just see an archetype as a character, then it can mean anything or nothing at all. It's only when there's an emotion, when there's a feeling attached and then a behavior associated with it, then it becomes archetypal because that's what influences our behaviors. You, me, and everyone else are just a combination of thoughts, emotions, and actions, right? And so what this tool does, each one of these feeling tones that you tune into, what you're really tuning into isn't just that feeling. You're identifying the narrative associated with that feeling. You're identifying the emotion, and most importantly, the behavior. Because what brands do is they trigger behaviors in us, that's what they're there for, by stimulating or mimicking behaviors they want. So they will show images, they will talk about words that activate and trigger behaviors that they want in us. And each one of these, when you group them, are archetypal by nature. Yeah, it's interesting. I remember when you showed me through the platform and uh, it, what you were saying there about how designers kind of, you sort of, you're doing, you're doing some of this stuff already, but you might not be able to put a sort of a name to it or, or be able to understand why you've chosen that particular combination or what you're looking for. But I remember going yeah. through the platform and you were showing me some examples and one of them you showed was, I think it was the visionary. And as soon as, soon as you showed me the visionary, I, I, I suddenly had this epiphany moment. I was like, yes, that, that's what it looks like. That's exactly what it looks yeah. like. You could just see it in front of you. And it's something that you've you pr probably in your head, you could pull bits together, but it wouldn't be complete. And then you could just see it in front of you. It was amazing how it just suddenly this visual language was there of the thing that you were trying to put your finger on, but you couldn't put your finger on it. It was that, it was exactly. really interesting. Yeah. When, when we were building the database, we offered it free to marketeers from around the world. We said, we'll map your brand in exchange for feedback. 
and one everything. I mean, you know, let's say there was two people who didn't, but the vast majority would say, actually, what this does is tell me what I inherently felt, but didn't have the language to describe. So one of the classic archetypal tones, if you work with archetypes and there's, you know, the love them and hate them. It's a Marmite job. You know, I've talked to creatives who absolutely hate it, strategists and, and then people who love it. But let's just roll with it for a little bit. The, the One of the ones that's often used is a magician, right? And it's the most misused, misinformed one. It's like, what can it be? You know, it's a magician, everything from an old bearded man all the way through to Paul Daniels, through to some science, through what is it, right? Because the whole point about all of these things and, and having just 12 in a way is that the breadth of them is so wide that they can end up meaning everything and nothing, as Carl Jung said, right? So actually what by really drilling it down and building a real database built on real brands, I mean, this is almost almost 3,000 brands we've mapped now to say, right, we haven't just gone out and picked these things. These are These brands were mapped and we've just taken those elements until we found 60 common patterns. And everything has been mapped through that. The good, the bad, the ugly. I mean, we've mapped some awful brands and we've mapped some amazing brands. Oh, let me tell you one thing I really find fascinating is that when you map a really lovely brand, it feels lovely. Do you know, it just feels lovely to because what comes through are these different emotions and you really feel them and, it's, and it moves you and you engage with it. When you meet some technology brand who doesn't know what they're doing and have, have put all these images together of people shaking hands and smiling faces and talking about innovation, it's like bitty. It's like, ugh, it just doesn't hang together. And what good designers inherently do is like they do this feeling and they make it feel great. And actually, when we map it, we end up feeling great because it's a beautiful experience to, to map something that is so clear. And it's just lovely. Anyway, that yeah. went off track a bit, but never mind. That was, was I just, no yes. Yeah, so I was going to say, actually, it's interesting. I do, uh, we well, we do brand audits occasionally and we'll, we'll look at, well, quite a lot of time, but we look at a sector, for example, and uh, you'll look at the the market. So if the client that we're working with will do an audit of the other um sort of players in that market and we'll look at them and one of the things we look at is the visual identity and it's amazing like you said and um, there's a couple of things with that but it's amazing how how many times you see there is rules to a category like you said you can't always you can't break the rules if it's kind of an education space there are certain things you don't want to uh, not include but there's also it's amazing how often you see in a market this uh competitor copying so everyone is the same there's no unique voice that stands totally. out nothing there at all it's it's very uh, samey and like you said if you can just change the topping on that pizza in that industry you can just change that little bit to tell a slightly different story the impact you can have in that is is unbelievable so one of one of the things that we did we were asked to do was um for the chartered institute of marketing um the head of um head of marketing there um was interested in this model and we mapped their brand against their competitors and guess what? You know, when you just look at it cold, they just feel the same. You could stick one logo on another, all say the thing, the websites. One of the really interesting things that came out of that, but also a lot, was when you try and say too much and you end up saying nothing at all, right? And what that means is brands try and throw in this look and feel. So we talked about the visionary and they throw a bit of visionary in and a bit of this and a bit of that. And they're all trying to throw it in and mix it up. And you end up coming away with nothing. Because what actually happens, what I know when we map these things, is you just go, Ugh. it's just like you can't, you can't take anything in. You can't feel anything because they're all fighting. They're all clashing. And actually, what really good brands do is they say less, but they do it more powerfully and more cleanly. And what that does is it creates an authenticity to their tone. It just feels right. Um, and, you know, I've done it, you've done it, you know, you get that pitch for a client and they go, all oh, right. And they want to change the brand. And you look at it and you think it is a mess right now. We know it's a mess. That's why you want the work doing it. You're in a sector that looks like a mess. And it's like, why does it feel such a mess? And it's basically because they've thrown together badly these feeling tones. That is bad design. That's 
the essence of what it's like you throw colors with the wrong words with the wrong layout with the wrong shape and the whole images and nothing matches I, I i was mapping literally this morning a brand in the us and they were talking about they're the most innovative forward thinking company and they had a picture of the husband and wife stood there and it was just like they it was like that doesn't work does it it just doesn't work together mm. you know it's a lovely picture of them they were you know a lovely couple but it doesn't sit with the idea and that is why what good design does why would you employ a designer it's because you've got an idea that you want them to visually communicate and make people feel more now the interesting thing is you can get them to feel it a little bit but how do you really get them to feel it and it's like this moment when all of this comes together that they just really feel it and that's the difference between bad design medium design and amazing design